well, take with take your Bibles or smart device or whatever your case is and uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. Chapter 16, where uh, I was telling Ron earlier this morning that uh, when I um, away from expository preaching for too long, I feel really insecure. So uh, here we are back in, back in Matthew and we're in chapter 16 at this point. We're going to look at verses 1 through 12. So let me read the verses for you and then we'll, we'll dive right in. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came and to test him, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the, the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, Watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They began discussing it among themselves, saying, We brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, O oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000? How many baskets you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000? How many baskets you gathered? How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So there's our passage. And uh, just to get our bearings in terms of where Jesus is at this point in his ministry, um, chapter 15 ended with these words in verse 39, and after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. So this is where it takes place, a Sea of Galilee, you can see it's on the north of the land of Israel. Um, spends a lot of time in Capernaum and Bethsaida. In chapter 14 and verse 35, we're told he's in Gennesaret. So for this particular passage, he's right there on Magadan on the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. And uh, you might wonder why they wouldn't have just walked. That was a few miles, certainly walking distance. Well, they had a boat. And uh, it was close to the Sea of Galilee, so... Why not take the boat? That's what they did. So in this verse, uh, in this passage, I, su I should say verses 1 through 12, overall, Jesus is talking to us about spiritual dangers that we must be aware of. There's a warning here uh, in uh, verses 1 through 4, as well as verses 5 through 12. He uh, literally warns them at the end of verse 11, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But really the whole passage has this bewareness to it. It has this sense of warning to it. So Jesus is warning us about spiritual dangers that we must be aware of. And the first spiritual danger he is seeking after signs. That's the point of verses 1 through 4. So we're told that the Pharisees and Sadducees came. 
Uh, the Pharisees are pretty familiar to us already in Matthew's gospel. They were the religious conservatives of the time. They were the righteous of the righteous in terms of outward appearance anyway. They specialized in enforcing their legalistic view of the, the various laws of the Old Testament in detail. That's what, they, that's what their reputation was. But now we're introduced to the Sadducees. This is the first time that they're mentioned in uh, Matthew's gospel. And actually, the Pharisees and Sadducees were theological opposites. They were adversaries in a lot of ways, sort of like Republicans and Democrats. So it's kind of strange that the Pharisees and Sadducee, Sadducees came together to question Jesus because the, if the Pharisees were conservatives, the Sadducees were theological liberals. They only accepted the first five books of the Bible, the, the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And even then, they were like Thomas Jefferson and stripped away anything to do with the supernatural. In fact, they didn't believe in eternal life. They didn't believe in the afterlife. They didn't believe, therefore, in eternal rewards and punishments. They didn't believe in angels or demons. They were all about the here and now. And because of that, um, there was no sense of absolute morality to the Sadducees. And it didn't matter to them if uh, they cooperated with the Roman occupying government because it's all about the here and now. Then you die and that's it. So again, the Pharisees and Sadducees made strange bedfellows, but alas, they had a common enemy, Jesus. And in their unity of uh, hatred and opposition to Jesus, they found common ground. And so they came to Jesus. And you'll notice that Matthew says they came to him to test him. So this is not an honest question. Jesus, teacher, master, rabbi, we have a question for you. And it wasn't them wanting to sit down and have an honest conversation about religion, but they came to him with a loaded question, as it were, um, an agenda. And that agenda was to test Jesus, to trip him up in his words, to expose him in their minds as a false teacher, a false prophet, and a false messiah. And this is what they requested. Show us a sign from heaven. Now, that's a lot of nerve. That's what Jesus has been doing. He's been healing the sick and casting out demons, raising the dead, feeding crowds of thousands of people from a few fish and loaves. In fact, he himself in his person is a sign from heaven. He's God in the flesh, the eternal uh, Son of God, Word of God in human form, standing right before them. And they had the nerve to say, show us a sign from heaven. It's as if they're saying, everything that you are and everything that you have done is not enough. We want to see God spell out in the Hebrew language in the heavens, Jesus is the Messiah. That's what we want. Show us that. Well, here's the thing about 
demanding signs, it never is enough. If, if God would have done that and spelled out in Hebrew, using the stars to stroke out his writing, they wouldn't have believed that. They would have, they would have wanted more. So Jesus knows what's going on, of course. So here's his response to their request. He answered them in verse 2, When it is evening, you say, it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be stormy today, for the sky is red and threatening. There's a sailor's adage. It says, red sky at night, sailor's delight. Red sky at morning, sailor take warning. And that's the idea. They were amateur meteorologists. They, they could look at the clouds in the sky and the color of the sky and reach a pretty accurate prediction of what the weather's going to be that day or the, or the next day. But it turns out that they may have been, they may have uh, had a passing grade in terms of being amateur meteorologists, but they were terrible at theology. And so Jesus reproves them. Second half of verse 3, you know how to interpret the appearance of the sky but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. And the signs of the times doesn't mean what's going on in the political scene of the Roman Empire or the Sanhedrin. It's the times relative to the kingdom of God. Here the kingdom of God is upon you because the Messiah has come. And you were blind to that. You are blind to that. Here's Jesus' conclusion in verse 4. It's not that the signs that Jesus had performed, his miracles, it's not that the incarnation as a sign it's not that any of those signs attesting to who Jesus is as the Messiah and the Son of God were unclear or insufficient to get across the message intended by God. The problem was not with the signs. The problem was with them. Jesus says, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. But no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. Jesus said the same thing on another occasion in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 39. No sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. And typically in the Bible, repetition implies importance, it's emphasis. So, Jesus is emphasizing the importance of recognizing the signs that point to his person and work as the Redeemer. That's what Jonah was all about. There's the story of Jonah that is a historical fact. It really happened that he voluntarily was cast overboard from a ship and swallowed by a great sea creature. And after three days was vomited out from the depths. Then he went forth to that great city of, city of Nineveh and preached. That really happened. But Jesus is saying that Jonah in his person and in his mission was a type of Christ, a sign pointing to the greater person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That he would be, he would be, uh, delivered over to death and at the same time voluntarily laying down his life for the good of others. But then he wouldn't stay in that 
place, but he would be raised from the dead on the third day. And his gospel would be preached not only by him, but by his empowered servants. But no more signs. No more signs from Jesus until his death and resurrection. So there's an element of judgment in this statement as well. And then Matthew wraps this up by saying, so he left them and departed. And before we move on, this is worthy of us just pausing and taking stock a little bit. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Do you know that Christianity in America is dominated, dominated by various denominations and movements that do exactly this, this. To them, it's all about signs and wonders. And you're nothing in the kingdom if you don't perform signs and wonders. But an evil and adulteration, uh, an adulterous generation seeks for a sign. And think about this. Those Pharisees and Sadducees were exposed to a lot of light because they witnessed the ministry of Jesus. And they were custodians of the Old Testament scriptures. They should have known that the Old Testament spoke of Christ. They should have known that the promised Messiah was standing in front of them. God incarnate was speaking with them. They should have known that, but they were blind to it. But do you know what Peter says about us? We have the prophetic word made more sure because of the completed canon of Scripture. Those Pharisees and Sadducees had a lot of light. We have more. We have the whole story. We know about Jesus' death on the cross and how he died on the cross for our sins. We know about how Jesus fulfilled all the types and shadows of the Old Testament. And he once for all dealt with sin by dying on the cross for us and taking away the sin of the world. We know that Jesus was raised from the dead as a historical fact attested to hundreds of eyewitnesses. And we know about the giving of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, the birth of the new covenant church and the ascension of Jesus to a place of glory and majesty at the right hand of God. We know about the second coming of Christ. This is what it's all about. All of the signs, past, present, and future, point to Jesus. What else do you want to see? What else do you want to hear? Keep your finger here and turn with me to the book of Hebrews. Really important passage. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. There was this step-by-step -step process of progressive revelation by which God delivered his mind to his people through the prophets whom he had chosen. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus whom he has appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. 
He is the radiance of the glory of God in the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And this divine son of God came for the specific purpose of redeeming his people. For the passage goes on, after making purification for sins on the cross, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high after his resurrection and ascension, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. By his son, God has spoken. You give me a word that isn't recorded for me in the scripture. Remember, we have the prophetic word made more sure. The scriptures which constantly point to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I say, you can have your word. I'll take this one, thank you. Beware, brothers and sisters, of a hankering after signs. Beware of those who sell you a bill of goods rather than being genuine prophets and apostles today. Do you know that we have people in Ridgecrest who claim to be apostles? Do you know that? An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign. Beware. Beware. But that's not the only warning in the passage. The next Warning is uh, regarding spiritual, um, I'm sorry, it is regarding hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. So in verses 5 through 12, we read this. When the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And leaven was a small chunk of dough that had a bunch of yeast in it. And the way bread was typically made was that you take this leaven and put it into a larger lump of dough and, and knead it so that the, uh, the yeastness of the leaven would permeate the entire lump. It was an invisible process, and I don't believe that people in the first century understood, understood the biology and chemistry involved, but they knew that it worked, and they knew how to do it. They knew how to take advantage of it. Sometimes in the New Testament, leaven is used as a positive metaphor. But sometimes it's used as a negative metaphor, and it's used as a negative metaphor here. The leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. There was something about the Pharisees and the Sadducees that invisibly, mysteriously, slowly could permeate the entire lump of the fellowship of the disciples the fellowship of the Christian community in a negative way. Watch and beware. Naturally, because the disciples are just like us, a little dense, they didn't get it. And so, verse 7, they began discussing it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, Oh, you of little faith, why are you discussing among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive, do you not remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Matthew wrote about that. Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Matthew wrote about that too. Chapter 14. 
How is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? By the way, sometimes an overly literalistic interpretation of the scriptures is wrong. Sometimes. Remember that when you come to the book of Revelation. So here's what Jesus was driving at. End of verse 11. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Said that in verse 6 as well. And now here's Matthew as a participant in this. And then as an author, after the fact, being enlightened and understanding what Jesus' point was. And so giving us this summary in verse 12. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. That's what they needed to be aware of. Well, that still raises the question, what was it about the teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees that they and us by extension are supposed to be aware of? Well, if you look with me over in Luke chapter 12, Chapter 12 and verse 1. In the meantime, when so many thousands of people had gathered together that they were trampling one another, he began to say to his disciples first, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. So, we have to beware of hypocrisy. The Pharisees were infamous for their hypocrisy. They were all about the outward appearance. They wanted to look righteous and holy outwardly. Even when they would fast, they would put on this long face so that people would know, oh, look, he's fasting. That's why he looks that way. What a holy person. They loved the uniform. They loved the place of honor. They loved to be called rabbi. They loved all of these detailed minutia of the old covenant law, especially when it came to imposing them on other people. And making other people feel like dirt. But inside, Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 23, inside they were like tombs filled with dead men's bones. All kinds of corruption and stench. Outside, beautiful appearance. Inside, death. In fact, in the previous chapter in Luke, we read this, starting in verse 37. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him, so he went in and reclined at table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner, because they had this elaborate washing uh, routine, ritual, which had nothing to do with sterilizing your hands so you, you didn't spread germs. It was a ritualistic, religious thing. They didn't want to defile themselves by eating food that they touched with defiled hands. So they went through this elaborate process that people needed to see them do, of course. And Jesus didn't do it. Jesus didn't wash his hands before eating which I need to remind my wife of next time this happens. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! 
Did not he who made the outside make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God, which has to do with the heart. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. Woe to you, Pharisees, for you love the best seed in the synagogues and greetings in the marketplaces. Woe to you, for you are like unmarked graves and people walk over them without knowing. Matthew 23, it's even more graphic, but I'm leaving that because that's coming up eventually. Augustine of Hippo, who lived from 354 to 430, Augustine or Augustine, whatever you prefer, he wrote this. It is not the being seen of men that is wrong, but doing these things for the purpose of being seen of men. The problem with the hypocrite is his motivation. He does not want to be holy. He only wants to seem to be holy. He is more concerned with his reputation for righteousness than about actually becoming righteous. The approbation of, when, of, of men matters more to him than the approval of God. Amen. That's the danger of hypocrisy. And do you know what the best antidote to hypocrisy is? The gospel. The gospel is the great equalizer. Because the gospel tells us that we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. We're all corrupt. We're all totally depraved. Polluted and defiled by sin in every faculty of our being. So that there is nothing in our natural state that we can do to please God. Nothing. We even need the grace and the mercy of God to draw us to Christ. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have no ground for boasting. And then we're accepted by God, not because of anything that we do or will do, because it's impossible there isn't any such thing. We're accepted by God, not by our own righteousness, but by an alien righteousness, a righteousness outside of ourselves, the very righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. And we receive that. It's, it's reckoned to us. It's credited to our account, not because we deserve it or earn it or merit it, but as a gift of God's free grace. Where's the boasting in that? Do you see? The, the gospel is the great equalizer. It is the antidote to hypocrisy. And further, we know that God sees the sins of our hearts. Do you remember the parable of the, tax co the uh, Pharisee and the tax collector in Luke chapter 18? The tax collector, the, these two men go to pray. One a Pharisee, one a tax collector. The, the tax collector can't even lift his eyes up, but he's just prost, prostate, prostrate. Prostate is something I take personally. Sorry. Couldn't even lift his eyes up, but he's beating his breast saying, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. And then there's the Pharisee who compares himself to other people, so he compares himself to him. Lord, I thank you that I'm not like other men. Thank you, I'm not like this wretch. I do this and I do that. Congratulations, God, you have me. Jesus said that tax collector went home to his house justified, declared righteous in God's sight. The Pharisee did not. See? 
the gospel is the great equalizer. It is the antidote for hypocrisy. If we are hypocrites, it's because we're missing the gospel. There's something about the gospel we're missing. If there's something about our church that's hypocritical, it's because there's something about our fellowship together that is missing the mark in terms of the gospel. And if there's something genuine about us, if there is something that is down to earth about us, if there's something that doesn't want to judge other people because we have enough trouble in our own backyard, it's because God in his grace has lovingly revealed the truth of his gospel to us. That is what we need to emphasize, the gospel. And we need to beware of hypocrisy. Another danger, another spiritual danger we need to be aware of is a low view of Christ. Because even though the Pharisees and Sadducees were adversaries, they were natural enemies, in so many other areas they had a common enemy, Jesus Christ. Look in Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, just to emphasize the point. Verse 53, and they led Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes came together. That's basically the Sanhedrin. This group of Jewish religious leaders, this group was dominated by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So here they are sitting in judgment of Jesus. And then there's chapter 15 and Verse 1, and as soon as it, as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, Sanhedrin, and they bound Jesus and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate. The chief priests were typically Sadducees. So here are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the scribes, this group and others sitting in judgment of Jesus and judging, condemning Jesus, reaching a verdict concerning Jesus. He is a blasphemer. He is worthy of death. Hand him over to Pilate for crucifixion. Obviously, a very low view of Christ. But even though we, not, we may not be able to replicate their exact steps. Obviously, we're in constant temptation of a low view of Christ. What I'd like to do is show you what a high view of Christ looks like and then how that um, can threaten us, how it's a danger to lose. Look in Colossians. There's a lot of passages we can look at. We're going to do a really quick jet tour through Colossians uh, chapters 1 and 2. So first of all, notice this high view of Christ from the Apostle Paul. This is who Jesus is. Chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus is the, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. We've, we've said before, God is by nature invisible. Jesus, as God incarnate, brings the invisible God into the visible realm. So that Jesus could say, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. For by him, verse 16, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Jesus is the creator. All things were created through him and for him. 
if Jesus was a created being, he would be an idol. For Paul to be able to say this, all things were created through him and for him, means that Jesus himself is God. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. It's all about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. <coughs> Pardon me. Why is that appropriate? For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell as if Paul hadn't already made that abundantly clear. Then skip down. Verse 27, what is the church all about? Uh, to them, the saints, the believers, the Christians, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we proclaim. What was the subject of Paul's preaching? Jesus Christ and him crucified. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. That is the goal of the Christian ministry. That was Paul's mission statement. Verse 29, For this I toil, struggling. That's how much work it is. That's how much work Paul expended. He toiled, he worked hard to the point of struggling, to the point of exhaustion. He didn't have his own energy, and so with all his energy that he powerfully works within me because it's all about him after all. Jesus. The message isn't what you can do to make your life better. What you can do to earn your way to heaven. What you can do to have your best life now or any other such hellish gobbledygook. The message is Christ. Him we proclaim. And then the Christian life is all about Christ. Notice in chapter 2, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, verse 3. Verse 9, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him. Verse 11, in him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands. Verse 12, with, uh, having been buried with him in baptism. And then, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God. And then verse 13, God made us alive together with him. Again, at the risk of being repetitive, it's not us, it's not what we do, it's us being in Christ and with Christ, him being with us. So what happens if we forget? What happens if somehow this exalted view of Christ gets diminished in our minds. Verse 16, chapter 2. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Christ is the point. As soon as we begin to have a diminished view of Christ, then we begin to elevate things that just don't matter. 
things that are just types and shadows at best. And do you know what we do? We begin to judge one another. We begin to have divisions. Because we forget about the preeminence of Christ. Verse 18, let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, pumped up without reason by his sensuous mind, and not holding fast to the head, who's Jesus. Catch that? These are opposite things. When we fall into errors like thinking that we're more holy because we beat up our bodies, or worshiping angels, or having these visions, these supposed visions, and other such things. Those are symptoms of not holding fast to the head, Jesus Christ. Notice verse 20 and following. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. That's fundamentalism. I am a fundamentalist in terms of the fundamentals of the faith, and I trust that you are too. But let us not be fundamentalists in terms of the emphasis of do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Why not? Well, Paul explains, referring to things that all perish as they are used according to human precepts and teachings. These kinds of legalistic things make sense to mere human beings. These indeed have an appearance of wisdom in promoting, get this, self-made religion. Not the revelation from God, not the mind of God, not the revealed will of God, but self-made religion. Where does it come from? Yourself. promoting self-made religion and asceticism and severity to the body. And here's the bottom line. But they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. Do you want to live a holy life? Do you want to put to death the deeds of the body? Do you want to grow in sanctification? Then hold fast to Jesus Christ, the head of the church. Have a high view of the exalted Jesus Christ. Beware of a low view of Christ. And finally for this morning, a low view of Scripture. Beware of a low view of Scripture. Both the Pharisees, the conservatives, and the Sadducees, the liberals, had a low view of Scripture. The Pharisees, in their Phariseeism, supposedly were all about conserving the Scriptures. But in their misguided efforts to conserve, they added to the Word of God. They added to the Word of God the traditions of men. And the boundaries became obscured so that they didn't know the difference. The people didn't know the difference. And back in chapter 15 of Matthew, Jesus criticized them for this. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9 Verse 3, you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition. Verse 6, for the sake of your tradition, you have made void 
the word of God. And then he um, applies uh, the upbraiding of Isaiah chapter, I think it's chapter 9, to them here. Isaiah 29, sorry. This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Careful of that. You may have strongly held opinions about a lot of things. I do. Make sure that you know the difference between your opinions and the Word of God. If the Word of God says, Thou shalt and thou shalt not, then by all means, by all means, lovingly, gently, humbly confront one another about such matters. But if not, if it's really your conviction about how you are personally going to apply a particular moral principle, then you do that to the glory of God with a clear conscience, but don't you dare judge your brother or your sister. Read Romans chapter 14 and, and others. Don't have a low view of Scripture like the Pharisees did by adding to it. But the other side of the coin, the Sadducees, remember, they were the, the liberals. They were anti-supernaturalists. In fact, Luke, later on in the book of Acts, uh, wrote this. This was Paul's experience. Acts 23 and verse 8. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. And we face this temptation. If you stand up and say, yeah, I believe the Bible, I believe every word that I read there, I believe that it's the word of God, I believe that it's infallible and inerrant and trustworthy and all that it affirms concerning morality and ethics and religion and history and science and every other subject that it touches on. Really? You mean to tell me that you believe that Jesus is the only way of salvation? Dig it? You narrow-minded fundamentalist? Really? You believe that Jesus was raised from the dead? That can't happen. Really? You believe in the story of Noah's Ark? Or you believe in the story of Jonah? Come on. You know what the Bible tells us to do? And I say this to myself, okay? No one's totally free of the fear of man. The Bible says that we should be willing to be called a fool for Christ's sake. Let God be true and every man a liar. The foolishness of God is wiser than men. And it pleased God through the foolishness of the message of the cross to confound the wisdom of the wise. But let us beware of making the word of God say something that it just doesn't say because we want contemporary scientists and doctors and whoever, professors, to not think that we're foolish. That's why I believe in Noah's Ark. Frankly, that's why I believe that God created heavens and the earth and the seas and everything in them, a space of six 24-hour days, and the seventh day he rested. Because that is what the Bible says, 
and there is nothing that is too hard for God, the God of Colossians chapter 1 can do that. If you're an unbeliever, I have an amazing sign for you. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to make Pastor Kevin levitate. I'm not going to speak in tongues. But I'm going to tell you from the Word of God that you, like me, were born in sin. You were born with a sinful nature. And from the moment that you were able to exert your free will, you've sinned. You've been a self-willed rebel against your Creator God. And God is aware of all that. He knows all of that. And someday if you stay in the same spiritual state in which you were brought into this world, in which you were conceived and born, you're going to give an account for that. But God who is rich in mercy, the God of love, sent his own son, his eternal son, into this world came a man, Jesus. And he lived in this sin-cursed world. And he endured the typical temptations and downfalls and challenges of this world that we do, yet without sin. And he did all of that, not just to set an example, though he did that, and he is our example, and we are called to follow his example. But he did that primarily to save his people. He did that so that when he would die on the cross, he would be the Lamb of God who is unblemished himself so that there wouldn't be any sins required because the wages of sin is death. And if he's a sinner and he died, well, that's what he deserved. But Jesus didn't die for his own sins. He died for the sins of the world, the sins of his people, the sins of the church. And this is a death that has eternal value because Jesus wasn't an ordinary man. He was the God-man. And his death is of infinite value. And so now he offers he offers through Christians and through Christian ministers to share this message of salvation and redemption. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter who you are, where you're from, and what you've done. Any of it. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ without exception, and you will be saved. Now and for eternity. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this glorious narrative of this event from the life of Jesus. Thank you for Jesus himself, all that he is and all that he has done and continues to do for sinners like us. Pray, Lord, that you would strengthen this church, that you would help us to take heed, and that you would continue to save sinners and Add to our number such as should be saved. In Jesus' name we pray.